perennials and arrange them in a, um, in a design um, irrespective of any outside information, um, irrespective of any knowledge of these conditions or the structure around it or anything else. Simply using the rule of three and the uh, asymmetrical design principles to arrange these plants in a, um, in, in a form. And I'm sure that if, when I do this in a class in person, which I'm so sorry that we can't do this in person, we usually end up with something like this. Somebody takes the- uh, Audio, it uh, says what? Okay, I'm on audio, then it says what? And puts the biggest tree in the middle of it. Yeah. Then they take the three shrubs, the next thing, and they arrange them around the plant. Like it that. says microphone, check with a say, check oh, mark, and then it's the same as fill system. In. So they're going to fill these things in here like this, like this, like this, like this, like this. Okay. So, and we end up with. Okay, a so it says speaker. There's two choices. Um, one says speakers, point. real tech. Someone needs adapter. to turn off the second one is checked and says same as system. Kristen, hold on a minute. Someone's talking over the speaker. In a situation, you might want to do It's not a volume thing. I've tried that. It's the, the thing is on. Um, I can't hear anything. It gets the signal saying say, um, say that the it was the speak, your speaker hey, is this not is working. So important. Let's put it to the right it. one Kristen, third of this design. Kirsten. And let's take the next three smaller shrubs and arrange them similarly so they are not exactly lined up in a row, but they are kind of grouped a little bit differently. Um, and they have been uh, placed in such a way that they offset the weight of the large tree to start to do that, okay? And then you take the shrubs and perennials and you stick them in there and you end up with an arrangement that again is much less, oops, sorry, much less um, formal than the alternative. Notice how uh, in your mind's eye, you can see the movement from the smaller plants um, in the front left up to the larger plants at the back, right? And um, notice that you, that you that the groupings of plants are not stilted. They are, they are arranged in such a way that um, creates interest and allows you to fill in between them with other plants that would even add yet again more interest. Now, I would um, also suggest that in the uh, image on the lower right that you could simply add masses of even lower ground cover type of plants around as filler between, between those plants. So this is just one, one little tiny exercise um, for, for asymmetrical design principles. So welcome back. And we're gonna start now in the second half of this, the second third, the second third, is that right? The second yes. of three sessions. And this session is called the design process. And the design process is, um, is, is taking you from soup to nuts, um, nuts to soup, whatever the expression is. And you've already talked about the principles. We've talked about the, the elements of landscape design. We've talked about some of the goals of why we are starting with design. And the first thing we wanna do if we're gonna be digging in the ground is we want to make sure that we do so safely. 811 is the, um, the, the number that the, the emergency contact, not emergency, the routine contact for getting your lines marked. Misutilities, we used to call it, okay? Call misutility to mark um, underground utility lines. This is not going to mark um, irrigation lines. It's not going to mark your electric dog fence. It's not going to mark other things that you might have buried in the ground, but it will mark your electrical, your gas line, your water lines, um, and other kinds of things. Sometimes they mark um, um, cable lines, um, and but bottom line is you need to use them. If you break a line that has been marked, you will be expected to pay for the repair. If you break a line that has been marked incorrectly, that responsibility is on them. And generally the wiggle room is about one foot on each side of that line. So be very respectful of what's underground for your safety as well as um, you know, the, the, the um, future landscape design that you're going to be putting into place. And I'm not doing that right, there we go. Okay, 
Um, all right. So the first step is going to be your needs and wants analysis, your soil analysis. You need to do a little bit of a, um, a soil search here, okay? How will your property be used? How will it be used in the future? How is it gonna be used now? What is it being used for now? What is the architectural style of your home? What kinds of practices can you incorporate as you begin to think about changing things around? Um, what is your budget and your time frame? Um, I used to very squirm a lot when people asked me that question. Well, how much is it going to cost? Well, it did me no good though to design a twenty thousand dollar job for somebody that only wanted to spend ten or five even. Okay, so I would always ask that question: What do you want to spend? And uh, people were, were, were it was it was a hard conversation sometimes to decide, but many times. The budget determined that the job got done in stages. And in that case, with a professional designer, you could take the entire project and break it up into pieces. Some of those Van Omi, um, Sweden, um, uh, Omi Van Sweden jobs have been going on for decades um, in the installation of them. Who will install this garden? <laughs> you or a contractor? And if you're working with a contractor, you're going to be. Um, you need to monitor that very carefully and make sure that the prices are decided on and that the specifications are decided on as well. And of course, who's going to take care of this garden after it's installed? There are many professional landscape designers who will refuse to do a design or an installation for you unless you also buy into the maintenance plan for that, um, for that landscape for a year or even two years in some cases. Um, it's very important that the garden, the new garden, be maintained. There was a great misconception that native plants are somehow um, require less care than non-native plants. And that may be true in the long run if the conditions are perfect. But we rarely have perfect conditions in our urban landscape. And your new plants under any condition are going to need watering. The golden rule that we, um, we, we, we use here is one inch per week. One inch per week, one inch per week and a half. You need rainfall or irrigation of some kind to sustain your plants. And of course, the first thing is, do you do soil testing or have you done it? Because the base soil under your, in your landscape is not easily changed. And so, you need to make sure that you know what the conditions are on your site before you start. The initial um, base map um, is going to be somewhere in that kitchen drawer cabinet when you bought your home or your townhouse, or you can purchase a copy through the county zoning department, or you can simply measure out all the lines. Whatever you've got, clean it up and make it be, uh, clean it up and put it into your, uh, your base map that's clean and ready for your drawings, okay? Make lots of copies or make one copy and blow it up as large as you can do it so that you have room to work. Um, you can buy inexpensive tracing paper that you can use to make multiple layers over the top of your base map. And when we do this in a class, we do these different step one, step two, step three uh, plans using tracing paper. So you want to make sure that the space map has all the hardscaping on it, that it has your driveway, it has your house, it has your property lines, it has sidewalks. You need to make sure that it has your permanent features. If you have a shed that you're not planning on moving, make sure that goes on there. If you have uh, trees, mature trees that you're not planning on removing, make sure those go on there, all right? This is the, uh, the, your chance to set the foundation for your design. You should have a directional arrow that clearly indicates which way north is so you understand where, where the sun is coming from um, and how it's hitting your landscape. And ideally it needs to be to scale. Why to scale? Because when you begin putting plants into your landscape, if you don't have the proper size represented on your base map, you will, you will run into problems because you end up with too many plants in your space. 
if I could just reiterate. Okay, so step, the step four, the site analysis is a very, very critical step. You want to measure your views. You want to measure your, the areas that are not so good. You want to make sure you're putting screening up uh, or at least noting where you need a screen to block a, either a bad view or a, a winter wind or something like that. You're going to want to um, you know, add your existing plant material and the hardscapes. You also want to note where your slopes are. Where's the grade changes? Where are the downspouts? Where does water go when it rains? I encourage people to go out in your boots and raincoat when it rains onto your property and watch what happens to the rain. Watch what happens to the water. Not only the water that's coming off of your property, but the water that's coming off your neighbor's properties as well. Please note that the water collection zones and wet spots, places that stay wet for a long time. Um, mark the, your utilities. Uh, mark your traffic flow. Where does your family walk? How do you need to access the property on foot? And where does that, where do those pathways go to? What areas do they service? Service areas are like where your trash cans and your storage areas go, are areas that need to be accommodated because everybody needs them, okay? And finally, you need to note where the wetland areas are, any woodland areas or streams that are adjacent to your property so that you can be double sure to control uh, the runoff of water and other um, uh, products off of your property and onto the neighbors. You can see in the picture, um, also there is notations here about things that they don't like. For instance, the stoop, the front entrance to the door is too small. They know that they want to do that. They've marked where the gas meter is, okay? Because this gas man's gotta get to it, okay? Um, They've noticed that they, the terrace where they do their patio and the entertainment area is too small and they need more space there for the hot tub or whatever they're putting out there, okay? And of course, they have marked the location of the heat pump and other kinds of utility, um, um, you know, tools that are outside. And finally, they've marked overhead utilities. And this is really important because um, you're not going to be changing those unless you're paying big bucks and you have that opportunity to put them underground. You're going to be dealing with overhead wiring of some kind. Okay. Kirsten, can uh, you pause? Can Janet, you hear jump me? in if you see something? Yeah. Can you can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Go ahead, Janet. Okay. Janet, so, you talking? Yes. If uh, you muted, Janet. There oh. is a. There is a. Um. I don't think I'm muted. Uh. Can everybody else hear me? Go ahead. Okay, so there is a comment, a very valid comment about how the drawings take up so much time. And the handout that Kirsten had sent around to folks in, a, in advance had a series of maps, which um, is uh, does show you how the, the complete landscape design process works. Um, some of them look very, very complicated and um, re do require a great deal of time um, to, to, to put the drawings in. I, I would suggest for those of you who don't have the time or skills or desire to go through that complete set of maps, the most important map for you to do and that everybody should be able to do is the base map. And that is, and it is critical. It is critical that the base map be accurate, um, be to scale. Put it on, do, do it initially on on graph paper so that you are very accurate in the spacing and sizing. And then what you do is that base map. Um, you can either make photocopies of it, multiple photocopies. Um, or uh, you can scan it and then reuse it, but you're going to want to put tracing paper or you can just use a photocopy and then do freehand sketches on top of it, which you can keep or you can keep changing. The base map never changes. And you can, from a copy of the base map, you can do a lot of these subsequent exercises, the subsequent steps in the process 
in a way that doesn't look as professional as the, a landscape designer or a landscape architecture might complete them, but that can still be very helpful to you. If I could just chime in, Janet, um, I just want to say that Kirsten and Janet are giving you a terrific overview if you're going to landscape your entire yard at once. Nobody does that. The, the point of this process when we get to session three is to take a small bed in your yard and work a little bit at a time. So that would be my remark about, yeah, it's, it seems daunting. Do the big drawing and then do chunks of, of design. That's exactly right, Val, and I, I think that's a good point too. But, but the discovery process that Janet was talking about is something that, that lasts a long time. And it helps you to understand the holistic um, 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 view of your entire property. And even if you only want to design, say, a section of your front door, say, to the left of that front door area right here, you know, you're still going to want to have to, this information. So, you know, this is a process, okay? You can use it or not. Okay, but this is how we think of it when we, when we, when we do this. Um, some of the important, most important things that you can discover in that process is what your site growing conditions are. Uh, slope, tree roots, those are all going, those are going to affect the, uh, the ability of your plants to thrive in that area. Your exposure and your microclimate conditions that the plants are exposed to is gonna be very different on the north side of your house as opposed to the west side of your home. Um, if you have characteristics of, sand, of your soil, which are heavy clay or sand soils, there are some, um, your treatment of that soil and your plant selection are going to be dependent on how you either mitigate that soil or what kind of soil you have, because there is no such thing as one plant that does well in every single kind of soil conditions, all right? The pH is very, very important. And it's one of the reasons for that is that it's hard to change your base pH. Your base pH is determined by bedrock and the minerals in the soil. And without knowing that pH, you might be putting plants that are doomed to failure in your landscape or worse, um, requires tremendous inputs of, of um, chemicals, you know, something fertilizers or something like that to help them thrive. And of course, finally, the depth of the soil matters too. There's some of us that have um, very deep soil and others that have a rock very close below the surface or even a hard pan layer like my son has in Southern North Carolina. Okay, um, Janet put this together and I, I just wanna say that the, the sun conditions are something that you need to be very, very aware of. Your plant resource books typically have three categories of light requirements, full sun, well, full shade tolerance, and of course, part sun or part shade tolerance. We define these different kinds of, uh, of quantities of light in this way. Full sun is six to eight hours of direct sun. Part sun, four to six, part shade, two to four, and of course, full shade less than two hours of sun. You ignore this information at your own power, okay? Because um, the plants that like sun, you want to make sure that they're getting that. And if it indicates that it wants full sun, you need to try to make sure, do a sun study to make sure that the area you want to plant them in is going to get that much sun. Sun studies are very simple. The most simple, simplest way to do it is to go to watch your landscape, um, go out and with, mark this, where the shadows are, um, how many, you know, put a stake in, put a marker on the stake, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, something and so on. And that will help you understand where the sunlight is at any given time and how much shade you have in that area. You can also, Go ahead. I'll just add that um, be careful how you use the terminology. Um, it is it is common for people to uh, get confused between the term full sun and direct sun. So you don't have full sun in the morning and part sun in the afternoon. 
um because you're if you say that you're really mixing up the terminology full sun is not the same as direct sun full sun refers to quantity the number of hours um it may be direct sun it may be indirect sun um but it's really those terms refer to the quantities not necessarily whether it's dappled light or it's direct sun i would add another qualification which has to do with the quality of light and um and the temperature of light <laughs> um if you will and i'm mixing metaphors here a little bit but if you have a plant that wants full sun but wilts in the shade of the day, in, in the sh wilts in the heat of the afternoon, you don't want to put it on the south or the west side where it gets that hot afternoon sun. Or you know, if you have something that wants shade um, but doesn't doesn't like the exposure to the cold winters, you probably going to want to put it on the east side and not the north side of your structure. Okay where it has the east side would probably provide a little tiny bit of protection, okay? So um, these are uh, just some ideas for you about choosing plants for different light conditions. The fifth step is to consider sustainability and how you can work in uh, sustainable features. You know, can you reuse existing landscape material? Can you eliminate turf? Can you install a cistern or a rain barrel to recycle rainwater? Can you... Um, replace non-natives with native plants. Maybe not all at once, but one at a time. One, you know, three at a time, okay? Um, can you recycle materials that have been torn up if you're tearing up your driver? Can you make a stone wall out of it or something like that? So there's lots of things you can do. Sometimes you can use your site analysis to do some really wonderful things. Uh, if you have a wet spot or a seep on your property, um, you can turn sometimes those into uh, beautiful focal points in your landscape. Um, the picture at the lower left is of, of an area that was a, a, a kind of a swampy wet area all the time and it excavated a little bit more, made it into a rain garden and uh, ended up with a beautiful, beautiful asset. Um, something happened to my screen. Let's see here. Okay, there we go. Okay. All right, you have to understand your water flows and where they're coming from. You need to make sure that you uh, understand if the water comes off your neighbor's property, you understand where it's going. Look at the topography of your yard as well as theirs. Where does the water stand? Where does the water go? Are there areas that are always wet or always dry? And how much impervious surface do you have and what can you do about it? Um, simply putting planters on top of your of an impervious driveway or a patio helps reduce stormwater runoff in a, in a significant way. And finally, where are the spigots? Where are you going to um, get water from when you need it? And how are you going to access the rest of your landscape in that way? Another important point to remember is to group plants together that have similar needs. If you have an area of your landscape which is going to be hard to water and hard to take care of, Make sure that you are uh, grouping plants in those areas that don't require so much attention and save plants that need a lot of attention for areas where it's easier for you to work with them and where you can group, meet their similar needs um, with, with identical treatment. Okay, um, drawing step six is to do something called a bubble diagram. The bubble diagram is your concept, your concept of what your landscape is going to be when you get finished. Um, what are the functions of this landscape? Um, do you have uh, an area where you want to work uh, outside? Where do you want to put your vegetable garden? Where are you going to, um, to do planting screens and planting view openings, you know? so that you can take advantage of those things. Where are you going to do your entertainment? Where are you going to do your, your play space with your children if you have them? Um, and you, you know, this is a chance for you to, to again, to marry the, the original plant with your site analysis to now come up with this stage, which basically um, begins to diagram out the areas that have those similar needs and similar functions and will be 
treated in much the same way. The bubble plot diagram is a great place for you to um, study how you can make the most of your space. Um, can you make your landscape do double duty? You know, if you need shade over the top of a, um, a, a outdoor entertainment area, can you build a pergola that will hold either edible or non-edible plants that will provide shade and um, 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 a canopy, you know, create kind of an outdoor room there for you? Um, can you consider the benefits of the bio landscaping that we talked about earlier to take advantage of beautiful things that your neighbor might have? Um, can you work with your neighbors to create a, um, a shared feature that works for both of you, like a hedge or a tree planting or a mixed border of perennials? This is a wonderful, I want to encourage you to collaborate with your neighbors, okay? Now, for many people, this idea of doing design in, in that kind of layer and plan view is very difficult. And so I encourage you to think about these bubble diagram areas in terms of three-dimensional spaces. Um, your three-dimensional spaces can be thought of as a block, of a block of space um, that has floors and walls and ceilings. Uh, your ceiling, of course, is obviously, you know, tree canopy coverage, um, pergola coverage of patios. Um, your floors are gonna be your pavement, your lawn, your ground cover areas. Um, and of course your walls are gonna be not little, well, might be little walls actually, you know, fences and structures like that, but they could also be uh, layers of plants that form those um, enclosing type of, of um, plantings. Think of your garden as if it was a living room. This is a picture of the Glen Carlin Community Garden, um, which is one of the Master Gardens of Northern Virginia's demonstration gardens at the Glen Carlin Library in Arlington. Um, they have a pergola, a beautiful pergola that was donated years ago and which has just been replaced or refurbished, I believe. It's obviously an outdoor room. People gather there, they come, they're, they're surrounded by gardens and um, it, it has a, it has multiple, multiple functions. We use it for entertaining, we use it for education. There's lots of beautiful things to, to do with a structure like that. But you don't have to have the hard structure. You could remove that structure and still create that outdoor room in that space, okay? By simply adding a tree or two or three, you can imagine um, that if those posts that hold up the roof were replaced with trees, you would have a gorgeous, gorgeous little outdoor room right there that formed, that formed the fun, exactly the same functions as that structure. Um, use lighting very carefully if you use it in the garden. Um, you can add use lighting to add security, but it doesn't have to be runway lighting. And by runway lighting, I mean uh, the, 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 the walkways, the lights are lined up on both sides of the walkway or the driveway. Um, it's much better to do, to do those, those uh, asymmetric design principles and do a zigzag type approach to lighting so that one lighted area leads the eye to another lighted area and so on. Um, canopy or up lighting of trees is a gorgeous way to add, um, to showcase a, a focal point in, at nighttime. Um, um, you know, if you have a, a, a multi-stem beautiful tree like a river birch or a service berry in a, an entrance planting, lights can be installed to shine up underneath the canopy and up into the, into the tree that is then reflected in a very soft way out onto the uh, landscape. And of course, area lighting um, can be done um, as well. And there's lots and lots of different kinds of options for those who want to add light into your landscape. Kirsten, if I could just interject um, a comment about the times. You know, since during the pandemic, a lot of people are, are um, using their outdoor spaces more frequently, both for, um, you know, personal pleasure, but also for entertaining. And so I, I see a lot more people who are putting more um, string lights or other kinds of lighting in, in their landscape, in their yards, so that they can use it a larger number of hours and for, um, uh, for their guests as well. Um, I think that, that practice is probably here to stay, but um, just be careful about how you're using it and how frequently. It's not necessary to put it on an automatic timer so that every single night it comes on for six hours. 
um, you know, just just have some judicious use of the lighting, both um, for environmental reasons and also for, you know, courtesy to neighbors. Right. Thank you for that, Jenna. The light pollution is a very real concern um, in our urban areas, and so um, just um, consult with a professional about uh, professional landscape um, lighting um, to make sure that we're not doing something <laughs> obnoxious to our neighbors or to the to the uh, not birds and so on that live on share our spaces with us. Um, this photo is of the um, Koi Shade Demonstration Garden. Again, another one of the Master Gardens of Northern Virginia maintained demonstration and teaching gardens in Arlington. Um, it is on the site of an old quarry, which is in Bonaire Park. And I show this picture only to say this is a springtime picture uh, with many ephemerals um, um, uh, growing and flowering at that time, which then of course changed completely come summertime. And um, I, I, again, in the context of our discussion right now, you can see how the trees around it, and of course the center point tree focus function as a kind of a canopy over the top of this outdoor room, which is framed by the walls of the stone. So this is a, this is a really beautiful garden. I encourage you to come and share. Um, I think Janet put into the chat box the Master Gardens of Northern Virginia website, and you can find information about um, all of our demonstration gardens in that in that chat box. Okay, the next step seven. And again, at this point, you have uh, you may have already completed the step, but this is where you're going to put your pads and your bed lines and your hardscapes plan. Those are the things that are going to be immutable, so to speak. You know, the pads should be ideally five feet wide for two people on an entrance path, um, three foot wide for one person. Um, even work paths that you use to access garden spaces need to be wide enough for um, someone to walk down it with a plant, with a tool, with a wheelbarrow. And so make sure that you can flow uh, through your landscape easily and not restrict the space uh, for, for walking. Make sure that every hardscape feature is included on, for sure, again, on this plan. You've gone from, from this plan here, okay, your bottle concept, which doesn't necessarily have all the hardscaping on it. It just gives you con your conceptual ideas about how you're going to do this. And then it's going to go to your, your lines and your hardscaping plan that includes rocks, it includes fences, it includes um, walls and so on that you need to have included in the plan. The picture here shows um, uh, just another emphasis picture here to consider your focal points. Um, if the focal points are going to be a piece of hardscaping, a piece of fence, make sure those get included onto the plan. So helpful hints, um, try to limit the numbers of different kinds of materials that you are using in your landscape. And I say that only because what do we all do? We go to the garden center and we say, oh, that's a beautiful plant. I'm gonna bring that home and plant that. Okay, or um, we end up with a hodgepodge of plant material, um, which has many times has very little relationship to each other. It's not that the design has not been thought out about where that plant should go. We simply walk around looking for a space to put it in. The same thing is true of hardscaping. You know, you come home with a with a piece of statuary from a vacation trip. You come home with a a huge rock that you picked up on the side of the road. That's, that's all fun stuff, okay? But try to limit how many different materials you use will add harmony to your landscape or will not distract from the landscape. Buy materials, especially rock materials in bulk, but buy enough the first time because you're not always guaranteed that you can find the same material in the same color again. So if there is a, a job that you're doing that is going to require um, um, a substantial quantity of material, especially a job that requires that material over a, an extended period of time, make sure you're buying enough the first time. You can probably take it back afterwards. And my personal prejudice, don't use dyed materials. Try to stick with natural colors and natural materials as much as possible that have not been treated and, um, and use rock very carefully. 
Um, I, I personally prefer when rock is used in the landscape to place it in such a way so that it looks natural and looks like it might have occurred in your bioregionally native area. Beds and berms and grade changes are something that a tool that you should employ um, as, um, when, when they are advantageous to you. Don't be, don't be shy about adding, um, adding a large berm to your landscape to add visual interest, grade changes, to raise the level of planting, um, or even simply to make it easier to work on, okay? Um, <laughs> I, I, had, I had a job with a client who, who had a very large berm that had been installed by leftover material from the building process. And he said, should we take that away? And I said, no, let's make something out of it. And uh, he laughed, he looked at me and laughed and said that we can always tell people that's where we buried the last occupant of the house. But um, all kidding aside, sometimes the raised plantings will do better, especially if you have very wet soil and making your plants um, into a berm will help you to, um, I'm sorry, will help you to um, remove, get those plant roots out of the water. A little caution about, about making islands in lawns. You want to make sure that you don't do so many that they detract from the overall design. And adding a lot of individual little beds in your lawn can actually look choppy and can look disjointed. My personal advice is make your beds bigger than smaller. And that was a lesson that I learned early in my career when my, uh, a, a, a woman who was a very um, talented, knowledgeable about perennials said to me, it's too small, make it bigger. And, uh, and of course, when we get to talking about plants a little bit, you'll be able to see what we're talking about a little bit too about the size of plants. But you can use beds and berms to frame your landscape. And um, sometimes they can frame, be a backstop for view. Sometimes they can add height. For example, in this picture, you can see how the slope um, from the, the, the grade falls away from the porch to the front of the bed. It falls away down the driveway and it falls away to the right down past the air conditioner. If you raise up that corner planting, it will help frame the house a little bit better. And of course, tree plantings in that space will the, um, will we'll match the desired size more quickly that way. So um, I, I'm, um, I, I think berms used carefully and correctly can also direct water to and from certain areas and can be used to collect water in a rain garden effect or even to, um, to funnel it off to other areas if you wish to use it carefully. When you are drawing plants into your design and thinking about the size of the beds you use, you need to make sure that you are planning for the plant's mature natural size. Um, what you buy at the garden center as a one gallon plant is going to be many times that size after it has matured. The, the um, saying is first they sleep, then they creep, and then they leap. All right, so that's, a, that's a, a good characteristic. If you plant your landscape, if you plan your landscape for plants that are going to look filled in in the first year, by the time you have gotten to year three or year five, you will be removing plants because there's too much material there. So make sure you plan for the mature size, not for the purchase size. I cannot offer you a substitute or an easy way to learn right plant, right place. That takes years of study. It, it, it takes you some good catalogs. Um, if you like, um, uh, if you really like uh, a certain kind of plant, you need to learn about that plant. You need to learn how, what it grows like, what it looks like, what it, what it looks good with. And one of the best things that we have at our disposal to do that are some wonderful public gardens here. You know, Green Springs in Fairfax County, um, the U.S. Botanical Garden, the, you know, in D.C. Plants are labeled. You can see the labels. You can see what they're growing with. And um, the, the, um, 
the plant labels also the on um, plants in the garden center, they're not always true. So make sure that you understand what you're buying and what you're planting, um, preferably before it becomes crowded or, or otherwise. One strategy to employ, uh, if you can't stand that bare open look uh, in year one, is to fill in with other annuals or other plants between your perennials and shrubs so until they get large enough to fill the space on their own. And I'll just uh, tag on to that. One thing that is great filler are herbs. Okay, so I, I like to use parsley and plant it in a lot of, tuck it in a diff, lot of different places. It provides great texture. Um, I use it a lot. It grows back very quickly. So be, be creative in terms of how to fill in spaces on a temporary basis. Great, any other ideas about that? What, do, what have, it, have some of you done about accommodating for mature sizes? One idea I've heard of is, is okay, so I have the space, it's five by five feet, and I want to have a bunch of have one Baptisia there. So I'll buy three of them, put on the space first year and second year, and then by the third year, I'm going to give them away and transplant one or two so that I can um, accommodate the, the growing size of that Baptisia in that space. So, you know, you're just going to have to know what the mature size is and make sure that you account for that. So Kirsten, we have a question on that um, about what would be a good substitute for where English ivy is holding the earth firm for erosion purposes. Would herbs do that trick? Well, they would if they're getting full sun. You know, if you, uh, ivy is typically grown on, on slopes where you have, where you have shade because nothing else much will grow there. And so, um, if you are removing ivy and replacing them with native plants, make sure that you're replacing them with plants that are uh, suitable for that same environment that the ivy is growing in. Um, ivy is, is, is um, very effective ground cover. It also has run amok because people have allowed it to grow up into the trees. And anytime ivy gets above three feet tall on a vertical basis, it will begin to transform itself into a seed and flower producing mature plant. Um, if you have ivy on your property, um, the best thing you can do is remove it. But the second best thing is keep it from growing vertically in any form or fashion. Keep it off of trees, keep it off of fences, keep it off of your houses, because it will produce seeds that the birds then feed on and spread through the landscape. I want to show you, to, and that's a good segue into this next question here, because I think that we should go here and just look at this just for a second. This is the, uh, I don't know, shall I be able to do that? Let's see if I can do it this way. Going to be able to get that up there? No, we're not. It's it. Um, I'm going to go back to share screen here. Okay. The um, Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia have, uh, which Janet has put into the chat box website for, has two sections. One's called Tried and True Plant Fact Sheets for Northern Virginia. There's another feature in there called Best Bets. And the Best Bets feature is um, a wonderful resource for you to try to find plants that have particular um, uses, okay? You wanna replace ivy, you have shade, you have wet soils. There is a Best Bets native plants page for those particular needs. Another wonderful source is this native plants of for wildlife habitat and conservation landscaping. Let's see if I can get that up there. No, but I can't. Not, let me say, okay. Focus. Okay, anyway, um, that, that, um, that is an incredible resource that lists individual plants, but at the back of the um, at the back of the book, it lists plants for a purpose. 
And if you have a, a specifically a device of plants up into sections for particular um, uses on a dry slope, a wet slope, a wet shady location, and it identifies trees made of trees, shrubs, and ground cover plants, as well as forms that will serve those purposes. Okay, the Plant Nova Natives resource also has um, a, a feature like that that allows you to choose um, plants for a particular use. There's also a Virginia Tech, um, Virginia Tech um, resource dendrology site, which allows you to plug in um, conditions that you have for trees and they will, it will select a tree for you. And I will share that with you at the next break so that you have that um, website as well. All right. So uh, we laugh about this. What is the master gardener mantra? And uh, the answer is, have you done a soil test? Okay, but the real mantra is right plant, right place. And this is really, really important as we begin to go into the last stage of the planning phase. And the step eight is the planting plan, okay? And this is the first part of the planting plan. This is your generic planning. This is where you're gonna put the types of trees, the types of shrubs, the types of perennials. You know, what is the, maybe not the specific number and the names, but the masses of plants and the types of plants and how they relate to each other. This is a, a step in the process, which moves you from the bubble diagram through the site analysis. And now you are able to incorporate the, the permanent plantings that you have along with the changes you want to do. Notice they have added the um, enlarged patio here. They've increased the size of the workspace in the back here. They've added a pergola for shade. And these symbols are highly variable and you can make the symbols be whatever you want them to be. But it's good to have this kind of an overview so that you are knowing what it is that you are doing as you get through this process and go into the next step. This plan is going to have containers on it. It's going to have, um, you know, a clear picture in your mind of where what's perennial, what's 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 annual, what's deciduous, what's evergreen, and where they're going to go. The second part of the uh, preliminary planting plan is the very specific planning that you're going to do. This is where you're going to add species, cultivars. You're going to take note of plant qualities and quantities that are needed. This is where you're going to do uh, your plant needs assessment. Make sure that the plants that you choose are fitting the space, the environment, the soil type, and the maintenance you're willing to give. That's a really big one, okay? Understand your plant and knowing your plant and what is involved with owning that plant is, um, is part of choosing it. And if you're not um, ready to, to give the kind of time that it needs to that, you might want to reconsider. So what are we doing here? This is a typical Northern Virginia, a little dated photograph here of, of, a, of a suburban landscape. Here we have what we have, um, Japanese, uh, uh, cherry here, we've got uh, maybe a, a viburnum here on the corner, we've got hedges of Japanese holly, um, we've got azaleas back here in the back. There is nothing native in this landscape, all right? But we, what if we took the same approach that we took when we looked at the townhouse garden and begin to understand the forms and functions of these plants? Can we replace that with a redbud tree? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Is it gonna have almost the same size? It's gonna be a small tree for a street side, yes. Bay Magnolia at the corner might do the job of filling, being a nice corner planting for a house this size. Um, if you have complete shade and you don't need a lawn for a dog or for your kids, sedges or other kinds of ground covers for the shade will do a fine replacement of grass. Most of the choices you have for replacing grass are not very um, traffic tolerant. And so you need to analyze that. And if you need to uh, accommodate heavy traffic or play traffic, lawn might still be your best option for those areas. Sweet Spire or Alonia uh, would be a fine replacement for some of the plants that are non-native that are forming functions as foundation plants. 
beauty bay in the back there might do the job of providing a mass of plant under the window. And of course, cone flowers massed at the, um, at the gate would be fine. Is this an only selection you can do? No, there are dozens and dozens of plants that you could kind of put in and out depending on what your personal preference is. Extreme garden makeovers. Uh, you know, some of us have been in places like this. Well, this particular job took this and turned it into that. Okay. Do you need to know what those plants are? Were there a lot of herbs and it's an exerophytic garden, which means that it doesn't need a lot of water. Once it gets established, it's, it's going to survive on its own and thrive with a minimal amount of maintenance. It might not be suitable for our area any longer. With climate change, we're getting large rains um, and soil is, seems to be staying wetter in some cases. And certainly we're getting more violent storms that are requiring attention to slope management. So be careful about that. When I lived in Bloomington, there was a landscaper whose wife was an artist and uh, he would sell a lot of jobs by taking a picture of a house like the upper left and taking it home to his wife who then painted a watercolor landscape around that house. She didn't know plants and it didn't matter. She sold the job just on the idea that that house was going to look like that when the man got done planting it. And it was only after he had actually um, sold the idea using the painting that he then took you know, his plant books and assigned a value to that plant. You know, oh, this is an upright um, spreading plant. We need a bay magnolia here. Um, we need a mass of yellow here. We're going to use cone flowers. You know, this is a hard place to put plants. There's a shade. We're going to put some, some, some things here that are going to do fine, some, some antenaria or something like that as a ground cover. But it was the image that sold the job, and the plants were icing on the cake. The next series of slides shows um, a little bit of an exercise similar to what we did um, with the little um, um, exercise. Um, earlier with asymmetrical planting, which of course this is. Asymmetrical arrangement plant, we know nothing about the structure other than we have, uh, we need a plant here, a deciduous shrub, six to 12 feet tall over there. We need evergreen shrubs in front of it. We need ornamental grasses. We need herbaceous perennials, deciduous shrubs, and so on. Those are the criteria. So if you want to turn this into a native landscape design, you have to just choose a plant that fits that need. Now, <laughs> there's some questionable things, dwarf oak leaf hydrangea, cultivar, bee balm, little blue stem grasses perhaps here as a kind of a mass of plants there. Maybe you wanna put some shamrock hollows in there as your evergreen shrub. Maybe you want to do a fringe tree as your focal point, your, your, um, your, your specimen plant. But you don't have to use this only to do native plants. Let's say you want to do an edible landscape design, okay? And you have the same exact criteria, okay? What are you going to use? Some of us are into edible landscaping. Use a pawpaw, add rosemary or aronia as a shrubby uh, mass. How about using high bush blueberries? And I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, as a shrub here, maybe you have uh, a mass of, of beets the leaves are amazing, um, curly parsley, maybe an ornamental grass, asparagus, but don't ever use fennel. <laughs> you go to let fennel go to seed in your garden, you will have fennel babies forever. Um, the question that always comes up with edible landscape design is, but what if I want to eat it? Well, eat it. Fill it in with other plants as you go along, okay? And if you are planting something that has very particular requirements like blueberries, you're going to make sure that those plants are growing in a container because it's very hard to supply the pH requirements of blueberries when it's mixed into another landscape that does not necessarily prefer the same conditions. So be careful about that. The pH matters. The pH matters a lot. Um, and there are lots and lots of plants that will do fine for you as, as ornamental edibles. You want to do a white landscape design? What can you do? Father Gilla, you get the idea, okay? Well, maybe not morning light miscanthus, okay? Morning light miscanthus is a, a now invasive plant here. So don't use that. <laughs> okay, so you get the idea. Choose the, the, the plant names and types 
after you have done your design. Always use bioregionally native plants. And what I mean by bioregionally native um, are plants that have been um, grown here, that have been chosen, uh, like, uh, like Earth Sangha was, um, uh, grows. Um, these are plants that have been grown and produce seeds in this area. They will be much better suited for our area than anything that's grown somewhere else. Um, if you, sorry. This park, this is one, another one of our demonstration gardens. This is a photo from Simpson Park Garden in Alexandria with a um, beautiful combination of asters and goldenrod. And um, all these gardens are listed on the mgmv.org website with directions to get to them. And I hope you'll come visit. But the bioregionally native plants are heads and tails above what is going to be native in Southwest Virginia. What's native in Southeast Virginia is not necessarily what's native here. And what's native here is what we'll call them bioregionally native plants. If you're designing ornamental beds with perennials, you want to make sure that wider and bigger is generally better. If you can, um, if you have the land to spare and the time to spare to maintain it, uh, you will not go wrong with having a larger rather than a smaller bed. The plants will be happier. You can mass them together for a bigger effect. And it's, it creates a stunning uh, opportunity to, to contrast, provide contrast between different kinds of plants. You want to plant in drifts. Think of color block. Think of drifts of three, five, seven or more so that you are able to mask the effect of the color and so on uh, in the landscape. There's a difference between massing and crowding. And if you crowd plants, they will not do well. And some of the maintenance that's involved with maintaining perennials requires you to dig them up once in a while and divide them so that they don't become too crowded. Uh, if they become too crowded, sometimes they will um, um, stop blooming. They will um, uh, die in the center. And you, it's up to you to rejuvenate them from time to time. And of course, remember to use your design principles, the symmetry, the balance. The unity and the repetition of color from one area of your garden to another area of your garden will be a long way of tying together um, your landscape. Some more tips on tricks and using color. Um, I am a big fan of color. I don't believe there's such a thing as nature's colors clashing with each other. But if you limit the number of colors and design your, your color roster in such a way that they harmonize with each other, you can get some really exciting effects. Um, I am not an exclusively native plant person, but I do adhere to the 30 to 70% rule, you know, um, and if we can do something together to help the environment, we should do that with selection of native plants. But some of the stunning color combinations I've, I've played with, I've got um, um, coneflower, purple coneflower with, um, um, Russian sage with liatris. They're all blues. They're all blues or purples or lavenders. And that was a summer combination, same blue combination in the springtime um, um, with um, um, hyacinth, purple hyacinth, um, lamium, dead nettle, and little purple Dutch iris. It was stunning. It was stunning having those color hues planted next to each other. You can also go the opposite direction and use color opposites, get a color wheel and look at the color opposites. And the more contrast you make in the color, the more, um, more visual impact you might have. We talked about hot colors being exciting and being attracting the eye. And of course, pastels and blues and silvers and greens, they soothe and they push the eye away. Um, generally speaking, if you have, if you want color, you're gonna have to have full sun. Okay, that's just how it is. Um, and that's true of most plants, of course, there are exceptions, um, but the, and they vary with the season. So use color with purposeful exuberance to ac accomplish your pleasure. Finally, your planting plan at the end is going to be a, um, a, a very comprehensive list of the, the names of plants, cultivars if you're going to use them, um, the common names, uh, the quantity, the size of the plant you're going to buy, and of course, the type of root system that it has. 
Why is this important? This is important because when you take your plant list to the garden center, they might have something that's not quite what you want. They might sell you something unknowingly that is mislabeled. Um, they might not have, they might be able to get you um, a substitute that is acceptable. But keep in mind, in order to make a, a substitute acceptable, you have to understand what that plant is going to do in your landscape for you. Okay, um, keep an open mind, you know. So um, you don't have to do these fancy drawings, but it does help and it's a lot of fun if you have the patience and the time to do that. Okay, 58 seconds, all right. So this is your final planting plan. And of course, we're going to remember here that um, um, everything we do is correct. There's not one only correct answer. There's more than one solution for most situations. There's an allowance for personal taste. You need to be able to take what you want and incorporate it into your design in such a way that it gives you pleasure. This is your garden, this is for you, not for anybody else. And it's your needs and wants are unique to anybody else's. And um, designers, uh, professional designers will try to steer you in certain directions. Sometimes it's to sell you a certain power of the plants. Sometimes it's because they have discovered certain plant combinations that they think that your particular um, site would benefit from. But at the end of the day, it's your garden. and. Uh,